All right, thank you and welcome to today's tile webinar. Today, we are going to talk about um, shifting the dial to include those not in education. And we have the honor to have Frame Armstrong, Emily Cutts, and Henry Hepburn with us today. They are going to introduce themselves in a second. I'm just going to give a very short introduction to the format um, of today's tile webinar because it is a bit different than what we usually do. In today's webinar, we are going to use more a converse, conversational format um, with um, Henry Hepburn from Test Scotland um, moderating the conversation between Graham Armstrong and Emily Cutts. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we're going to address them at the end or if it fits into the conversation just right when you post it. Today, um, also very exciting, both of our speakers today, Graham Armstrong and Emily Cutts, are published authors. Here are the fantastic books. And so we are going to do a book draw at the end um, between among everyone who has um, come to our talk to, uh, to the talk today. Um, in order to enter the uh, prize um, book draw, please either scan in the QR code that you see on the slide here or you can also use the link that I shared in the chat. I will share it again here. All right. Um, during um, the conversation and um, the discussions um, of this tile webinar, I would uh, like to ask you to mute yourself um, and to turn off your cameras um, just for bandwidth um, reasons. And um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Henry Hepper now, who is going to take over the moderation of today's um, speaker series. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Carlina. Yeah, so just briefly, I think I'll just introduce myself and then uh, we can, uh, Graham and Emily can introduce themselves. So I'm the, I work for TES, uh, which is for those of you probably outside the UK and don't know, is basically a, magazine and uh, website, news website for teachers and other education professionals. Um, there are English and Scottish versions of the magazines reflecting the two very different education systems and I'm the editor for the Scottish side of things. Um, so I've been there 15 years. Um, I was just thinking there today that I've almost spent as long writing about education as I was in formal education, um, 13 years in school and a few years in university as well. and. Because I've had that long, you know, long time writing about it, and uh, you know, I've got some breadth of experience over, over a long time. I've seen a lot of changes. Um, just one observation I want to throw in there, because I know you're, most of you are really more interested in what you what Graham and Emily have to say. But um, when I think back to my own school days, I went to school from 1980 to 1993 to just to age myself. Um, I think school has school in Scotland certainly has changed a lot insofar as there's a real commitment, there's a real sense of moral purpose now in schools in Scotland on delivering for every child that comes through through their doors. Whether that's actually achieved in practice is, is a whole other matter. But certainly if you speak to pretty much any head teacher these days, compared to when I was in school, when there were a lot of kids who were there and it just felt like they were marking time to the left school. I don't feel that's the case in the same way now. Having said that. Uh, the structures that we operate within in Scotland, and again, I'm sure this is reflected in many other countries, we have 13 school years and the education system still seems to pivot around two terms in your second last year of school when, uh, you know, there's this vital six months or so where if you don't, you know, meet the grade, then quite literally, then, uh, you know, you could be struggling. And also, schools are far better now, offering a far broader range of experiences to pupils, but it still feels that that ultimately the system dictates that it's these exams that you sit in your second last year of school that you cram in for six months that really determine that is the most, you know, uh, that in, seems to be the, the most important aspect of school, regardless of, of what some people might say. That, and in that regard, school on that level has, doesn't seem to have changed very much since I was there many years ago. Anyway, just, a, just an observation to throw into the mix. Um, Graeme, would you like to introduce yourself at this stage? Good afternoon, everybody. I am Graeme Armstrong. I'm an author from Airdrie. And uh, just to set my schooling in context, I went to high school from 2003 until 2009. And I shared those years with being involved with young team gang culture at the time. 
um, and sharing that title of Glasgow murder capital of Europe. So it was a particularly violent period um, while I was growing up. Um, I was very lucky that I encountered um, a work of literary fiction that inspired me to study English. And I, and I read English studies at the University of Stirling. And then I went on to read um, creative writing and I took a master's degree in that. Um, and then after after seven years, I became a published author, writing about my experiences um, back in the, the Vietnam days of, of the Audrey. Emily, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, I think you just need to come off mute there. Apologies, I've muted myself. Hi, <laughs> um, I'm the room. Room. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I'm Emily, as you know, and um, I'm the director of the Children's Wood, which is a charity in the Mary Hill Ward of Glasgow. And we also have a G20 Youth Festival working with young people. Um, yeah, I've been through the Scottish schooling system. I was thinking, well, I've not got my dates, but it was in the 90s anyway. And um, yeah, what Henry, what Henry was saying there, I feel is still, so, we're still letting down, though the moral, like the will is there, I feel still so many people are being let down by this quite narrow system and small measurement. Um, so I'm, I've had a very um, keen interest in education since participating in it myself. But since leaving there, I worked in the early years and then uh, I studied psychology and uh, did a postgraduate as well. And my focus was uh, mostly in education. Um, looking at motivation and, and how some people succeed and others don't. Um, and that led me to work with the, at the Centre for Confidence and Wellbeing. And if anyone doesn't know about that centre, you should look it up. Um, in fact, my book was published through them. Uh, they've written, um, they've got a series of books um, looking at Scottish culture. It's a, it's a charity that really looks at some of the more negative aspects of Scottish culture and, dis and they were disseminating research. It was led by Carol Craig. And uh, during that time, a large part of their research and analysis was on Scottish culture and Scottish education. So I got really quite heavily influenced by my work there and came into contact with um, projects that were going on across Scotland that, that were quite exciting and ab abroad, America and other places. So things like the Violence Reduction Unit, looking at violence as a public health issue and um, uh, looking at educational approaches maybe in Scandinavia and things like this and so I got quite influenced by that and then wanted to apply some of this research in my area to try and make a difference locally and um, to the people you know my neighbours and, and my community and just to, to see if, I, if that could, could work and that's how the Children's Wood started um, so yeah so education, I'm, I'm really keen in inclusion and really feeling that everyone deserves the right to succeed in whatever way they wish it to be. So thank you for having me here. That's great. Thanks, Emily. I thought it was maybe worth before we really get stuck in and have a, just a bit of a chat, just recapping the, the, the context for this event. So uh, we're thinking about this phrase, not in education and quote marks, that's it's often used and it often has a sort of judgmental undertone. And it's describing young people who've been excluded from or refusing to attend school. Um, and again, this, I'm sure this is often very much the case in Scotland, still is uh, often the case that the, the onus is often placed on the young person's behaviour when we discuss issues like this, when often it seems we forget about the systems and structures that these young people find themselves in. Um, and as was also laid out in the, in the introduction to the event when you were all signed up, we know that the sense of belonging is powerful in education, yet from the very start of school to right through to higher education, those systems and structures can often be very unflexible and unwelcoming for many. Like I was saying earlier, the, the discussions around school, the often seems like schools are more inclusive and more uh, open to supporting all young people these days, but in practice those systems and structures maybe haven't changed as much as we would like. And if you don't fit into those structures, then you can quickly find yourself excluded by others, or maybe you take make that choice yourself to exclude yourself. So the question, I guess, the meat of what we're doing today, the, what we really want to discuss today is what needs to change so that we do in practice become more inclusive and flexible and in, in really meaningful and sustainable ways and at all levels of uh, education. And um, Graham, if I could, Come to you first. By the way, uh, I did just just to let you know. I saw that uh, one of our people watching on today is a teacher from Airdrie. So just to warn you, there might be someone out there that you know, <laughs> one of your old uh, uh, your old pals. Um, if they if they thought when I was there, they definitely knew me. Henry. 
<laughs> All the wrong <laughs> reasons. <laughs> and we should just say before we go any further as well that we've had sort of breaking news, not in the last few minutes, but in the last day or two, that uh, Graham, your, your novel's been shortlisted for Scotch Book of the Year, so congratulations for that on behalf of everybody today. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so when uh, when you're first contacted, what uh, I know there's a lot of demands in your time just now. Your your book has had so much attention, so much praise, and, and plaudits and prizes and nominations. So there's a lot of demands in your time just now. Why did you? Why were you interested in taking part in today's event? What appealed to you about today's event? Um, you know, there's about 350 secondary schools in Scotland, and I would say most of those have got some level of what we dealt with, especially if you're they're in a city or an area of high deprivation. But there's only one of me, you know, and there's six year groups, um, and the first four are most relevant. But if you do the maths there, I would need to be an awful lot of places to reach an awful lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's like um, throwing a bucket of water into a, a forest fire. You know, when they ask me to go and talk to kids, and oh, be yeah, I do it, you know, and, and uh, they choose carefully. They, they get all the bad ones from me, you know, <laughs> so we can give them a, a really specific talk around gangs and the, the issues. Um, I think I genuinely believe if you can change a teacher's opinion about some of the stuff that they see, um, and certainly about the way I used to present myself in school, I was, I was an Oscar worthy performer, you know, um, and it took a real specific kind of teacher to see beneath that performance and to recognise that there was talent and there was something that was um, worthy of nurture. Um, you know, and the, the education was the right route for me. You know, I was expelled from my first high school, um, you know, for assaulting another pupil. And I am now currently um, applying for a PhD, you know. So mm -hmm. the, the trajectory of between those is what I can contribute. Brilliant. And I believe you're, you're going to read for us a passage from your book. Yep. Um, just for some context, the, uh, the character of Donald MacGyver, who is uh, kind of um, towering figure of a six foot four rugby teacher, a uh, rugby coach and teacher, the head school leader, is very much inspired by my school leader in Cope Ridge High School. And um, the passage I'm following, I'm sorry if any of you haven't read the book, but there's, a, there's one of the, the young team gang are, are murdered um, in a gang fight. And uh, Mr MacGyver comes to Azzy, the protagonist's house, to, to try, and, try and stop the violence, basically. So it's an extracurricular. As he's left school by this time, he's, he's 18. I pull the door open and rest the bat in the corner. It's a big man himself. He looks elder. I hadn't seen him since I left school. I'd heard they'd retired this year. The big chief finally laying down the headrest. MacGyver's a different breed to the new types. New school buildings and ways have replaced the old ones we knew. Hello, Alan. Yeah, all right, sir. He's coming in. Thank you. He might look a bit grey up, but his frame's still broad and strong. But it's strange to see him in civvies. Usually it was his grey suit, white shirt and red tie. The only colour apart for the Fred Bain contour lines in his face, besides the thick moustache. I make Dean walk back into the living room with the mugs and hand on one. Firstly, I want to express my condolences about young Lucas. I know he was a friend of yours. Aye, it was a shock. So it all flared up again. Never stopped, really. I still keep in touch with the old place and help when I can. It's disappointing to hear of this. I hoped your lot would have moved on. You especially. Nah, still stuck in the rut as pair. Did you do anything with those two hires you worked so hard to get? Nah, no, yeah. I was thinking about college, but it never happened. No, yeah, anyways. Work? Nah, nothing. Start recession. Nobody's taking on for it. They're getting paid off constant. It's not easy at the moment, especially not around these parts. I'm not even very rude. But is this a social call? The big man shifts in his chair and laughs. No, Alan, it's not a social call. There's been a flavour of territorial violence in school. And the new headmistress asked me to get involved and give her a bit of info about the area and so on. She's pretty new to it. Well, she's in for a shot then. Well, this is it. It's complicated schooling in this area with these tensions. They don't come with a manual for the senior management team to follow. They need to learn it from scratch and quickly. They're trying to prevent any more tragedies like this. I understand. 
So I'm kind of help you, sir. No, that's not why I'm here. Your name's been floating around the school. Something to do with Matthew O'Connor and his girlfriend. Aye, we had that on in. In response to Lucas. I nod. The school was vandalised at the weekend. As a W is a dead man, in words to that effect. We follow in the hallowed footsteps of the YT legend before us. But I paint some got to hurt us. I just thought you should know in case they're genuine threats. I'm sure they are. They're all looking for me and Danny. The two is share a look. Nobody's been caught, MacGyver says, with a concerned expression. It was him, um, but who knows who'd done it? It could have been any of them. It would have been one of their younger ones. It's never one of the main cunts. It would have been one of the young ones trying to make a name for herself or who have bad parents and who drank and didn't show them any love. That's the way it works. There's wounded pups about here that turn into wild animals with no empathy. They're the stone-cold killers who pug cunts and jump in their head. The main men are the popular bold cunts, but usually they are no killers. They have their pick of the birds and pals. Too much to live for to throw it all away for a moment of senseless and serious violence. It's always the wee cunts you have to watch. The outsiders. Leaving that aside, how can you break the cycle? It's too late for Lucas, but not for you. We both sat and pondered us a minute. It seems barely believable that after all these years that we're actually here. MacGyver sighs and looks deflated. He'd always tried his best for us and was often accused of being a coach cart or wannabe as damning indictment. It wasn't true. MacGyver seen potential in people that others didn't. That was his powerful gift. The understanding in the big man's face is unparalleled. Thank you very much. Apologies about the swearing if you didn't expect that. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you, Graham. And I should say, um, Graham wrote a fantastic piece for our magazine back in June where, uh, as you say, the head teacher in the book is very much based on the head teacher that you had at your own school. And he and you finished the piece by um, your old head teacher's long since retired now, but uh, uh, he, I think he described you as his, as his last big success at school. And um, you finished the piece by saying that he came to your book launch in March 2020 to to see you, for, I guess, for the first time in many years, which must have been lovely for you. Yeah, it was really emotional, to be honest with you. Um, I heard he was retiring from the school, so this is very much based on a true story, and I heard he was retiring, and I took a wee retiral card up, and um, <clears throat> he sat and just talked to me for an hour on his last day, you know, a 30-year career, um, and just chatted, you know, and I was in my second year at university by that point, um, and when I wrote the line uh, in that chapter, they said, I'm no, I'm no living up to the he has expectations yet. I wrote that at that point, and I remembered when I was um, I was still drinking alcohol and still involved with the you know the gang. I had I had stopped taking drugs, but I was still involved, you know. And I, I felt like I wasn't living up to his expectation, you know. So it was a great moment for him to come and see me. Um, the, the success manifest, you know, at the, the end of the road. So it was beautiful. Absolutely. And um, Emily, what was uh, what appealed to you about taking part in today's event? Yeah, um, well, yeah, I, since, well, since starting the children's with my interest, like I said earlier, with the Centre for Confidence and Wellbeing, I was interested academically in the, in the idea, but when I actually started to apply some of the ideas and was starting to meet a lot of people in the community, I was realising how, how many people are failed by the education system. And it's not teachers, it's the system is really failing a lot of people. Um, and particularly with the G20 Youth Festival started 2018, and that was in response to um, antisocial behaviour of a group of young people, the young team, out um, setting fires, you know, um, all sorts, um, taking drugs, fighting, everything. Um, and um, half the community was like, no, we don't want them here, move them on, um, and thought, well, if we keep passing the problem, who, whose responsibility is this? So um, got engaged and got involved with the young people and just started to realise how many barriers these young people are facing and how unfair it is that they're not getting a chance to succeed, not for their own fault, uh, not, you know, it's not reasons beyond their control. 
Um, so I feel quite passionate about this because I, I do believe, particularly this group I, I've been working with, but um, all over, I remember it from when I was at school, you know, just a lot of people that could be succeeding in whatever way that is, but we have such a narrow definition of what that is that you often feel like you're a failure. And um, yeah, it, most recently, one of the young people said to me, I, I'd said, why don't we go up to the school and you could maybe, because we've been doing forest school, they said, oh, they don't like me up there. You know, they, so the fact that, you know, we could go up and help at that school, but they really feel hated and unliked by the school they went to is so sad. Um, so yeah, so I, I feel quite strongly about this, this subject and that's why I was keen to get involved. Oh, hi. Great. Sorry, I just lost you just for a couple of seconds, but then we'll get back oh, now. Okay. Um, yeah, so you, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you've got a passage from your own book you'd like to read to us. Yes, yeah, I mean, I mean mine's not quite as interesting as yours, Graham. I'm sure that's it's a bit more dry. <laughs> it's a bit more dry. So I wrote this book, um, it was Carol Craig actually asked me to write it, my old boss, um, and it's about it's about the campaign. We had, ran a very um, successful campaign where we fought off a £10 million housing, housing development um, to, and we did this through the children and engaging with local schools to get people outside. So I'm going to read you a chapter um, about um, the young people actually, and this is about the youth club. This is, we just started this when I wrote the book, so I've not long met the young people, maybe six months. So I'm going to read you a section for, from this. Um, so we've been working with a hard to reach group of young people who form a gang in our area. Their antisocial behaviour means that this particular group is known to residents and schools as well as Police Scotland, Tesco, McDonald's and local shops. Through our evening youth work, we have got to know these young people well and have developed trusting relationships with them. What we have found out is that many of this group come from very challenging family backgrounds. There's a lot of interest in adverse childhood experiences, ACEs nowadays, and many in this group would score highly. For those who aren't familiar, with this terminology, it means exposure in childhood and adolescence in the home to such things as a parent committing suicide or having mental health problems, a parent misusing alcohol or drugs, or witnessing domestic violence. ACEs also include the child's own experience of sexual, emotional, or physical abuse. These and other ACEs can be traumatic for young people. The ACE research shows that the more people encounter these types of events at home, the more stressed they are likely to be. This type of stress um, in childhood can undermine long-term physical and mental health and lead to addiction. Children and adolescents displaying challenging behaviour are often the ones who have suffered the most. But these weren't the only types of challenges these young people were suffering from. Boredom was also a factor. There was nothing free for them to do out with school apart from hang around. When they are in school, they are usually there for only 20% of the time and leave by lunchtime. They can also be very disruptive. In one incident, the school had to shut down for 45 minutes because of behavior issues. Given the disengagement from school, it's easy to see why many of this group hate school and leave without formal qualifications. School constantly makes them feel bad about themselves because they can't do the work. What's more, as a result of childhood trauma and stress, many can't control their emotional responses and end up doing something that lands them in a room alone or in detention. Given what's happened to so many of these youngsters, I feel that they are being so badly let down by the system and believe that we could be doing so much more for this group. The question we need to ask is how can we make compulsory education more meaningful, purposeful and developmental for this group of young people so that they can achieve something worthwhile? I believe that spaces like the Children's Wood have a role to play we believe if we could turn, um, so we began to target young people in this group who we saw as the leaders or influencers. And we believe that if we could turn their behavior around and support them to be more positive role models in their group, then change will happen. And throughout the outdoors, more of them will come to see learning as something meaningful and purposeful, and it will encourage them to feel that they're growing and developing. Probably one of the most rewarding moments for me since we started our youth work concerns a young person aged 10 at the time who's often hypervigilant, constantly on the lookout for danger. He's aggressive and badly behaved in school where teachers find it difficult to support his needs. If he goes to school at all, he very rarely stays beyond the morning break. Indeed, his teacher told me that in school he is almost impossible to work with. However, when he's on the land in the children's wood, the same boy is well behaved. I've never seen him in this aggressive side. Uh, one day, 
when I was on the land with the boy, he told me, I feel relaxed here. And another day when I was on the land celebrating my daughter's seventh birthday, that same boy turned up and we asked him to join us. He happily played hide and seek, tag and other games with us. He was like any other child his age, a complete contrast to the times when he threw a brick through a car window or attacked another schoolmate. This boy needs to play and relax in a natural environment where he feels safe. All this might seem trivial, but the fact that being in the children's wood made this boy feel relaxed, made all of this work, worth, work worthwhile. This boy is experiencing adversity. He is scared most of the time and his long-term future is not looking good. For him to say that he feels relaxed was profound. It was proof to me that nature has the power to help people and communities can facilitate this. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Henry. My turn to do the classic mistake on, on Zoom calls. Um, thanks so much for that. That was, that was fantastic. Um, I wonder, just following on from that, Emily, if I could ask you, um, like I say, so many people talk the talk these days about engaging all young people, and there is a lot of great stuff that goes on in schools, you know, Glasgow, where you are, there's been very big on nurture approaches for a long time. Um, the, the, the sheer, I mean, my daughter's just gone to start secondary school recently, and the sheer breadth of stuff that goes on in the school is far in excess of what was around when I was there. And there is a, a lot of stuff that's focused away from what might be you know, called traditional academic subjects, uh, much as I don't really like that way of describing them. Um, but why why is it, for, for all these good intentions, why is it, that, why are there still such barriers at a structural systemic level to, to something that most right-minded people would be, would agree was, was the right way ahead, was to sort of broaden the approach of education and, yeah. and uh, be more understanding of people's, uh, you know, difficulties and backgrounds that they come to school with? Yeah, I think there's quite a few reasons. One really important one is children start school far too early. So it's, it's, it begins way, way earlier. And um, the, the really children developmentally should be starting school at seven. And there should be a really high quality early years, kindergarten stage, where you have very well educated teachers, uh, I think. So there is those early things. But I think right now, what, what the approach I've taken with our young people, and which I feel is lacking, is starting where they are. I think we start where we want them to be. So we want them to be maths, English, you know, passing all these tests, but they might not be developmentally ready for that. And we, the system doesn't enable maybe different levels of speed at learning things or starting with what, where are you? What do you want to achieve um, kind of thing? Um, also, I, I do believe like it's like trying to stick a triangle in a circle. It just doesn't work, you know, so the, the system's sort of working for academic, a small number of academic people. But I think even the group I work with, but also a lot of other people come out a bit damaged from the education system. Um, uh, so yeah, not, and I'd like to say really, this is not teachers, it's a system like IE starting too early. Um, the other thing is I know from talking to some people is the education about trauma is maybe not, so, so something about teacher training, like I know outdoor learning is not part of the core curriculum for teachers at currently. Um, and trauma, um, I, I know from a few people who've done the teacher training courses, haven't done much in um, the AC stuff I was talking about in the book there. So I really feel there could be more at the, the teacher training side of things, but also the system, the school system, that now could be the time to really change things. Um, like if we can't change it now, it's never getting changed. Like having been through the pandemic, it, it feels like now is now is a good time to, to make a few radical changes but i think it needs to be much more radical than tinkering around the edges personally that's uh and graham you've uh, as you were saying earlier you've been you spent a lot of time in schools visiting schools talking to young people in the piece you wrote for us back in june you said uh, a basic philosophical question we should be asking all young men in schools in the west of scotland is why are you here so when you ask that question what comes back um, I, I don't think, to be honest with you, we had any clue why we were in school. Um, the, the majority of my friends were told by relatives or grandparents that the best thing for them to do was to get a trade. Uh, my own grandmother told me that, you should get a trade, son. 
now you know as somebody that was going to go down the academic route that wasn't good advice for me for lots of my friends it was good advice you know um but that kind of created an anti-intellectualism you know that um school and books and anything like that was uh, an undesirable pathway um that it, it um affected your street capital and your masculinity uh, it was something to be ashamed of. I can remember when I got into university, I was so incredibly delighted that, that my life just might not uh, end in prison or, or the cemetery, you know, prematurely. Um, you know, but I, I had it from friends. I was embarrassed to tell people I was at university, you know, when people found out they would almost use it against me. Um, so, you know, it's difficult to change that mindset, you know, which has been the product of 200 years of deindustrialization. You know, in the, in the heartland, you know, the, the industrial heartlands of Scotland, you know, in cities mm-hmm. like Glasgow. Um, how do you then tell these young men that, you know, their, their pathways are now academia, you know, and they should they should stay at school and apply themselves? It's difficult. Um, but as you were saying, you know, the, the core subjects, you know, like Pythagoras theorem, things like that, is that really impactful in, you know, a young person's life that's experiencing trauma? You know, we expect organisation for young men that come for chaos, mm-hmm. you know, um, so I, but I think you know, teachers used to say that to me. You know, what do you want to do when you leave school? And when they asked me when I was fourteen, fifteen, I said, "Well, who cares?" You know, I didn't even turn up. You know, mm. but when you asked me when I was sixteen after I did train spotting, I was desperate to stay on. You know, and, I, and then I told them I was going to study English, um, but the performance was too strong at that point. You know, and they couldn't see past my, uh, you know, the, the hard, the hard shell that I'd put out to the world. You know. And when you did eventually go down as a, as, a, as a teenager yourself, still in school, you did eventually start pursuing that uh, you know, more, acad- more academic route, we could call it. Was there, a, was there a moment when something just clicked for you, or was it a gradual process? I mean, uh, what eventually took you down that road? What was the uh, the thought, within? I think, to be honest with you, after reading, it came from resistance. It was almost mm-hmm. like like reverse psychology, but it was mm-hmm. totally unintentional. It wasn't kindness. You know, I, um, one of my... Um, teachers did an impression of me and I've told this story lots but it's something that's a really potent memory mm. you know and he swaggered in front of the class and he put like a nebby you know working class accent on mm. and said I'm Graham Armstrong I'm a great mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. um, he said what are you going to do when you leave school and mm. I said well I'm not leaving school I'm going to study English because I'd become you know I was around kids that were applying to UCAS mm. you know and all the, all the bad ones that like me had left I was the only one left I was the sole survivor um, so I had said to them, you know, well, I'll just put you in an all in. I've read Trainspot and I could probably read a couple more books. Um, you know, and, and they, they didn't believe me, you know. The, uh, one of them, who was being more kind, by the way, she said to me, there's too much reading in university for somebody like you. Um, and I, I didn't have the presence or the confidence, you know, at 16 to say, what do you mean somebody like me? You know, but of course, she, we know what she meant. You know, one mm-hmm. of the bad ones, one of the no-hopers, mm-hmm. one of the people who had already disengaged and was probably going to leave or fail. And I was just wasting everybody's time. You know, and I did what all young men do when they're given an opportunity. I made a complete arse of it um, because my mm-hmm. exam fell, unfortunately, on the day after Rangers were in the Europa Cup final in 2008. So I went and got lashed. I, uh, and I went in with a hangover and I, I bombed my English and I got an F. And one of the teachers who had, who had said to me, basically, you shouldn't be here, you know, you should be out working with the rest of your pals or no working, whatever, in the criminal justice system. She walked past me after hearing my result, I can only assume, and winked. She caught my eye deliberately and winked at me, you know, and that wink told me so many things about life mm. and who I was and how I was perceived. Um, and at that point, I decided that whatever it took to prove her wrong, I was going to do it, you know. Um, I mean, and, I, and I don't feel, you know. So, yeah, that was, that not- was really the start. And it's not all that long since you were at school, but I mean, I really, you know, as someone who writes about teaching all the time and, and writes on behalf of teachers, um, I really hope that things have changed a lot in that time and the sort of attitudes that you encountered as a, as a young man um, are, uh, if probably not completely uh, gone, but very, very rare, I would hope, in terms of some of the attitudes you encountered from teachers, which, but you know, it was too uh, it was too f- it was twofold as well, though. Mm-hmm. Um, as I, you know, there's, there's good and bad in all things, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, while some of my teachers were very detrimental, you know, and, and put me down, other ones lifted me up and went above and beyond the college, mm-hmm. even back yeah. then, like, you know, the real Mr. MacGyver, Mr. Rawlinson, like yeah. others who mentored me and who seen the potential. But I just made it very difficult to see, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but even when I was trying to express that, you know, that was what kind of hurt me, you know, mm-hmm. because I was trying and trying hard. And it was even more difficult for somebody like me 
Um, difficult in terms of like your your ego and your bravado and mm. this reputation that you carried around with you, you know, like a ball and chain. It was very difficult to kind of separate that, you know what I mean, for the for the ambition that I now had. But I, I managed yeah. it. I, I slipped in. And when you go into schools, um, and I know you also go into prisons as well and speak to young men in prison. Um, yeah. What 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 do you how do you approach them? What what do you find resonates with them and gets their attention? Well, I'll tell you, um, prison is a lot easier than school, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> because while in prison, um, you're not teaching any guys doing a life sentence and they don't know about life, you know, and their, their understanding of time is so profound um, that they're actually very appreciative of your time when you go in. Um, they're grateful for your time. They're um, really engaged um, in school. It's, you know, I made a joke about going into prison with a friend that I said, they're a captive audience. And you know what? I felt truly really bad about that because they're not. Um, everybody in prison opts to go into education. Mm -hmm. School are a captive audience. They need to go to school. Mm -hmm. And when they work, when they bring me in, um, you know, they, they disengage. But it's, I think it's um, I'm quite an authentic product. Mm -hmm. You know, but someone warned me at the very beginning. Let's be careful um, that you don't fall into the trap that we've always done. Right? Guys like us get a hero complex because we're mm -hmm. desperate to help young men change their lives. Right? So we, we parachute in, um, we know structure and no support for ourselves as well, by the way, because we're constantly reliving and experiencing and talking about trauma. Um, and, you know, we go into schools and then we tell these kids scary stories, you know, about how many friends of ours died and how many committed murders and all that. And, and young men just go, right, good for you. That's not going to happen to me because they're, all, they're invincible. So I think it needs to be done carefully and structured. Um, but they, I think what I try and do is reach them and talk about not just about the bad stuff, because that's the boring stuff, but about the different road, you know. And it takes a, a lot of confidence for a young person to go against other pals. We're great at telling young men what not to do, but we're very poor at telling them what they should do instead. Don't drink alcohol, don't take drugs, don't be involved in violence. So what do I do in a working class community when I've got no money? You know, you fall into cracks. And Emily, if I could ask a similar question of you, what... Maybe you could tell us a couple of stories about young people you've dealt with, uh, that you've worked with. Um, what do you find resonates? What what uh, what really fires them up and you know gets them interested in what you're doing and what what you can offer them? Yeah, again, um, it was starting where they were and finding out what they wanted, and and again, some of that was like like Graham was saying, now you don't really know sometimes. So we've thrown everything at them, like. Tricking, come and try this. Climbing, come and try that. We'll go mm -hmm. right water raft it. You know, we've done everything like just mm -hmm. to find out what they like. Um, so we, you know, we've got to know they, they like their graffiti, they like music, they like tricking, which is like parkour. So, and we just keep trying. And I think what like this power of belief that, uh, you know, when I was talking about the AC earlier, one thing that can really make a difference is someone believing in you. And no matter how many times maybe the young people might let us down or let other people down, we always believe in the good things in them and believe that they can do it and that they'll get there. And I, I feel that's really important. And I think in school, you can get really easily, because there's so many people in a class, time constraints, it's, it, it's very easy to pigeonhole people. Um, and to and particularly if there's lots of challenging behavior, you're the bad guy, you know, and. And then you can't see, and what I've realized is all of the young people we work with, every single one of them has a talent and has good qualities. And if you focus so much on what's wrong and what's bad, you don't ever get to see that and they miss out and you miss out. So, um, so partly what we've been trying to do is shine a light on the good things and trying to believe in them, even when they maybe don't believe in themselves and with the hope that, you know, sometimes you might not see them for months, then they'll come back when something's gone wrong and, you know, we're a safe place and we're, we're always going to be there. Um, so it's really just finding out, yeah, and I think creativity, so finding out what they want to do, uh, and that's just trying lots of things um, and, you know, speaking to people and, and finding out what, what they want and, and seeing how they are with different projects. Smaller, smaller groups as well work so well. I mean, and outdoors, like we find like the young people mostly respond incredibly well out four walls because there's nothing to bash against, mm. you know, you're free, it's relaxing. And the evidence suggests as well, like really strongly. And, and in fact, Neve, what Neve, one of Neve's students has, has done some study in the uh, research in the children's wood with this, 
is nature has the same effect as mindfulness. So even just if you're in nature, it calms you down. So if you're wanting children, so we, we've noticed children with ADHD, autism or, or trauma, when they come outdoors to a natural environment, it actually calms them down and they can then relax and then learn. If you're in a constant state of real stress, it's, it's very difficult to learn stuff um, because you're so worried of what's happening, you know, when, you know, when I have I slept, am I going to have food? And, you know, like your basic needs, you're worrying about that. Of course, if you can relax and calm down, you can um, learn. So we find the outsides really, um, really hugely beneficial. And they, they really like the outdoors as well, like fire making, you know, who doesn't like making a fire in a den and, and that kind of thing. So and now we're becoming a forest school center, we're trying to give qualifications in that and so that there could be jobs. So we've been trying to create jobs as well for the young people because there's maybe intergenerational unemployment and, you know, trying to, so they work with us, they do apprenticeships with us. We try and we've bought, well, not the children's way, but me and Sophia few others have bought some land up in the camp so we're trying to create some jobs up there for the young people. So yeah, it's just starting where they are really essentially, that's all it is, is, is and being, having the belief that you can get through and find out what it is that really makes them tick and involve them in a community. Yeah. And I saw a really nice quote from you, Emily. You said, we've become obsessed with our children achieving and succeeding in very narrowly defined areas. This comes at a cost to their mental health and well-being. And you've also talked about how um, we can tackle issues like mental health, addiction, and inclusion by applying a countercultural approach. Can you tell, tell us what you mean by that, by a countercultural approach? Well, I guess it's sort of business as usual. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and you would probably notice it so much in the last year is like we're on this hedonic tread we're on this treadmill you know we're we're on a trajectory of growth aren't we you know like you have this dream of making money and you know being successful and we also have a culture where it's very instant gratification is so we can get things really quickly but to actually get inner qualities you have to work quite hard at it and you have to slow down a bit and that's counter to what we're sort of told um, and what our culture kind of tells us. And having access to like green spaces locally can help you slow down. Um, community as well, it's kind of countercultural. Community is kind of countercultural at the moment because it's so, we're in such an individualistic um, society where we, you know, pursue your own, you know, we don't have churches any longer. So, uh, well, we do have churches, but they're not, the communities around churches are not as strong as they used to be. Um, and just the active community, we used to know your neighbours. And this is, obviously during lockdown, I think a lot of people saw community again, but we've been actively trying to build it over the last 10 years is to make people feel part of a community because communities can really, you know, relationships are the number one thing to make people happy. So, um, so I think helping with including people who are not included can sometimes take a, a countercultural approach. You need to be a bit slower, start where they are, um, having access to, to community, to green spaces and um, things that aren't obvious um, and aren't available. Like our community has created this, but not every community has that. So, and Graham, in terms of how you engage young people who maybe are disaffected with education, um, you talked about the attitude you encountered from some teachers, not all teachers, but some teachers in terms of them just scoffing at the prospect of you going to university and going down a, a, what they call an academic route. Um, is there a danger that even people who are well intentioned that uh, want the best for, for kids who've maybe had some sort of difficult childhood, that they start, start pushing them down certain roads towards, sort of, you know, vocational routes and paths and maybe close off things that might work for them that you know a more academic route uh, you know there might be even the, the even the well-intentioned people out there can sometimes close off certain avenues for young people i think sometimes we're all young people with our choice you know that mm -hmm. um we we look to professionalize language and explain things we say macy's and, and i totally you know i had a huge ace my father died when i was three years old you know um, and that certainly, um, okay, it wasn't a, um, an impactful, well, I suppose it was, you know, because I was involved in child psychology and all that, and I was kind of acting out, you know, and then it just settled down and my mum thought, everything's good, you know, and then, you know, I'm growing up now in the west of Scotland amidst a violent gang culture with no father in the house, you know, so I was trying to prove myself as a man, you know, so I think we, um, 
you know, sometimes we rob kids of their choice and their autonomy and the right to make a decision, you know. Um, but I think I think you're right, you know. I think school sometimes feels. I mean, you've got kids that captive audience for eight hours a day or, or six hours a day or whatever it is, right? And it's um, what do they want to achieve out of that? You know, if, like that philosophy. You know, well, if they don't want to go to uni, are they just basically treading water until they, you know, get an accepted for an apprenticeship, which they didn't need any exam results for anyway? So, what was the point of them going to school? You know, was it just babysitting with a couple of tests? You know, um, I don't know. It's difficult. I think we need a rethink of the whole education system now. But then you fall into the trap of saying, you know, so we, do we have performance schools where, you know, academic kids get sent mm -hmm. to? And then what, what are the schools that are not academic? Mm -hmm. You know, are they just hellhole dumping grounds mm -hmm. for all the no hopers like me? Because I would have been in one of those schools, guys, mm -hmm. you know? And then where would I, I wouldn't have ended up in university, you know? So it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structural question, I think. And can I you both then, um, like I said, I should preface this by saying once again, there's a, a whole host of amazing initiatives and things that schools do these days to to engage uh, young people coming from all backgrounds with all sorts of challenges in their lives. So there's a whole load of certainly in Scotland, a whole load of great stuff goes on, but clearly we're not in a perfect world yet. If both of you could sort of wave a magic wand overnight and change one thing about school, what would you do? Oh, there's two parts. I can't get one. You know what everyone should do? Now, I know we're talking about Graham's book and my book. You mm. must buy Class Rules okay. by James McInerney, right? He has got so many good, he is so evidence based. I feel we should start a campaign around that book because um, mm. he's got it's evidence based. Um, like Lock End S Secondary School, I don't know if anyone's come across it. They've got an employability officer. Mm. And I think this is genius. Like every single person goes on to a positive destination. It's in, I think the school's in Easter House, it's in the East End. That's maybe not the one thing I do, but I think it's brilliant. I think the one thing really that could make a difference is starting in those early years, starting earlier and the school starting age, like the upstart argument. Um, but there's a whole host of other things that could 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 happen. But I think starting children, if you start the, the thing about starting school too early, if you start a child at four and they're not ready, they're not developmentally ready to learn, they're going to feel like a failure at a very young age. And it's very difficult to shift that as you move through the education system. Mm -hmm. What what countries who start later, like seven or eight, like they they're all sort of at the same playing field by that point so they're all ready to learn and you've got less of the self-esteem being damaged by learning um from other looking at other countries anyway so I, I think that would be a good um thing that could be changed um I mean, you, Graham, what, what would you change if you change one thing about schools i yeah uh, i often talk about home economics you know that and i think um, what a waste of time that was for us because literally we didn't actually learn how to cook anything. It was just a, a kind of mess of it, you know, in, in a school like here, Jack Adam, a couple of high school, it was just a complete, you know, discipline nightmare, you know. I, I should um, declare, and, declare an interest by saying my wife's a home economics teacher. <laughs> but you know what? I think, I, I think we should rebrand it like life economics, right? And double its weighting, right? And it should teach you things like how to manage money. And I know that sometimes like Bank of Scotland are mm. come in, you know, and they would teach yeah. you that, but it's too late, you know, that should be mm. starting like at the beginning. Because we follow, as you say, you know, we've got a very structured idea where we think people mm. come from. 2.4 kids, you know, at least one working parent, if not two working parents, you come from organisation. You know what? It's just like life skills. Mm. You know, people say, oh, you shouldn't learn that in school. Well, if your parents don't teach you, where do you learn, guys? Mm. You know, I'll tell you where you learn. You learn for the third sector and charity organisations because the government doesn't do it for you and the school doesn't do it and the parents don't do it. Or you never learn, you go into the criminal justice system, you know, or you don't make it, mm. you know. And well, that's how serious it is, you know. And you know what? I think we could take at least a period or something, mm. a couple of periods a week mm. and teach kids relevant life skills. Mm. I'd look at people in their 30s and go, what did you know learn? What did your parents not teach you? Mm. Right? Like managing money, God. You know, well, yeah. a lot of my friends were okay at that because they were drug dealers, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I mean? They let the, the streets taught them things, you know what I mean? Um, and they learned the wrong ways, you know? And they didn't, they've never used maths or English, you know, or any of these academic subjects like maths, you know, physics or exit, you know what I mean? But they didn't have the necessary life skills to be successful adults, to cope, to manage. Um, and it is difficult, you know. I've been in, I've been in real periods of trauma and stress in my own life, 
and I've found it difficult to cope as an, an adult because of my past, and I'm a graduate, you know. Mm. So fantastic. And um, if you don't mind indulging me, I might just chip in with one thing I change, which is uh, I want the society at large to change the way we generally define success in schools. Um, I've been into fantastic schools and reported on them. Uh, I think of one school, I'll not name it, but in Edinburgh a couple of years ago, uh, I was there a couple of times and wrote features about just some of the absolutely amazing initiatives they were doing in one of the poorest parts of the, the city. Um, uh, and that included getting uh, getting kids to university at a rate that was, was just unheard of. You know, a few years previously, there, there was no one going to university from this school, but finding success in all sorts of ways. And really, in a bit of the most passionate staff you will ever find in a school. And then that that school finds itself at the bottom of school details because we've got this very very narrow the definition of success and i know it's one of the best schools in scotland and doing amazing things for those people's yet and those people who have a lot of people lack self-confidence confidence have a great relationship with the people the teachers they know they're doing great stuff but then there's a sort of cognitive dissonance because then they're getting slagged off online saying oh you go to the worst school in scotland and uh, there's something just morally and ethically wrong about that, I think. So that's that's me and my soapbox. But uh, <laughs> um, at this stage, uh, Carolina, I know we're, we're, we've been going for about an hour. Uh, oh, sorry, did you want to chip in there, Emily? Sorry. No, I was just I was agreeing with you. That, that, that's okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so I know we've not got all that long left. Uh, Carolina, do you have any questions that, to, to ask our yes, there's uh, Emily Graham? Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Jordan, uh, and I think it's addressed to Emily. Emily, your comment on individualism makes me think of how sometimes proposed um, alternative structures don't address some of the um, systemic issues, toxic masculinity, masculinity wealth inequality, food, um, sovereignty, environmental racism, and so on. Wondering if there are a multifaceted projects at play to address both. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, there, there's bigger things than community, but we've been trying to address some of the things you talk about at a local level. So, like the Children's Wood um, is four acres of land in a built-up urban area in an area that has got ten on one side of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation and one on the other. That's how extreme it is. But yet on this land, we can bring everyone together. No one's getting bought at, no one's getting sold at. No, In fact, there's a really good quote. I don't know if I'll be able to read it to you from someone. It's in my book um, that one of the local parents had said um, about the land, um, just about not be getting built, but, um, bought at. So I'm just going to quickly read this to you. My poor kids, they spend so much time in cars these days or inside shopping centres, even at the parks they're being sold to all the time, whether it's a burger or ice cream van in the Botanics or a bouncy castle in Kelvin Grove. We're lucky to have such amenities, yes, but luckier still just to have somewhere quiet and unspoilt where they can just kick about and be under no pressure to consume anything more than the brambles. I really don't think you can understand how much that means to children in our pressure cooker cities. So um, I think that sort of sums up, you know, there, there's such a toxic culture about and I, I think you can start to address some of this at a local level um, and you know through our youth club we've talked we've we're, we're addressing masculinity and um, and food poverty so the young people actually running food banks and um, so we're the young people who, who would usually be helped are actually helping others and they're growing so we've got a allotment that we've got and the young people um, plant the seeds harvest, watch them grow, tend to them, harvest them, cook with them, and then make meals for vulnerable people. So mostly we get addicts and, and homeless people coming and they give the food, you know, and they have, they've done this so, you know, so well. They helped during the pandemic to feed the community. So we're starting to change at a local level a little bit, just little changes um, uh, through the young people actively taking a role in, in being, in, in challenging some of these things. So, um, it's very difficult, obviously, you know, we can't do anything about income inequality at this local level, you know, that needs to be targeted, but we can help with the effects of inequality, like stress, and, um, and having communities who help one another, like back in the day where if someone had lost their, all their, their job, all the community would go around and buy them, you know, chip in bits of furniture or whatnot, so you know, I think bringing back a bit of that can, 
I think we shouldn't underestimate how powerful that is. Thank you so much. Um, there is another question that Catherine Reed wants to ask on camera. So Catherine, if you would just turn on your camera and your mic to ask the question. Hi. So I was really interested, especially as someone who used to teach um, for a very long time in that area about your experiences. And I noticed you were talking a lot about boys. And I was wanting to ask about female school refusers, because I I used to do a lot of work with kids who are quite uncertain about coming into school or who were coming into school specifically to get a qualification and get back out again. Um, you'd be amazed at how fast you can turn around a national for English if you really want to. But what I'm wondering is, where does that leave the girls? Girl, both girls who are involved in violent lifestyle styles and girls who stress and really, really difficult circumstances are maybe showing up in different ways. Who's that to? Um, either. <laughs> well, we certainly have quite a few girls who are school refusers. Uh, and in fact, I asked one of them, I'm giving a talk about this, what would you say? And she said, I just wish I had someone who would listen, because she cried, you know, she, she was crying and, and they just, nobody cared. Um, and, um, and, but she also said she did want to succeed in her class, but she couldn't. And nobody was there to sit with her. So she wants to succeed and she wants to learn, but she just can't. She's got so much going on in her mind and she's fine. She's slow and there isn't capacity in the class. I don't know if this is answering your question, but this is her specific experience. Uh, um, you know, she's not well supported, so she's failing. Um, so she's coming to work with, we work with a bit during the day. And so we are working with the schools, um, taking, working with, the young people that we work with out with the schools and we're working with them during the school day to support. And we've got quite a lot of female refusers, also ADHD, undiagnosed um, maybe issues as well. Um, the outdoors, again, some of the girls respond really well to that, like really well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but certainly we do come across girls that quite a bit. And for, I mean, it's a difficult question for me and people sometimes say to me, you know, the young team doesn't represent young women very well. And I say, well, you know, it might come as a surprise that at 14 years of age as a gang member, I wasn't that enlightened about the female experience. <laughs> You know, um, as much as I know about girls then is that, you know, I fancied them, <laughs> you know, um, obviously as I look back, you know, they were dealing with a whole host of issues that we were me, you know what I mean? Um, pregnancy being a big one, you know, the majority of girls that were in and in, in around our gang um, have got multiple children, you know, and they've experienced a different kind of deprivation that the men have. Um, because lots of the men will fall into the trades, whereas when women have got multiple kids and socioeconomic backgrounds, they tend not to work. You know, so their lives have been actually more difficult than the men's in a lot of ways. Um, now, obviously, that requires, you know, a, a parent and team, at least for conception, if not to raise a kid. Um, you know, but so it's a completely different host of issues. Um, but they were involved in as much violence and um, gangs as we were back in the day, you know. Um, so, absolutely. You know, I don't think the young team can speak for young females because I wasn't a young female, you know. So, what, I, I feel like think? we... I'm, sorry. Oh no, that was I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. That's that's, that's no, a teacher I'm, I'm just saying, I, <laughs> um, I was just going to say I just I'm, I'm desperate for the day where uh, someone sends me a book and it's the the female young team experience, you know, because I'll be a massive supporter of that book. <laughs> I I just wonder, like, what can we do? What can we do to get young men and young women talking to each other and seeing each other as human? As teachers, what should we be doing to try and make sure that young men aren't leaving school thinking, well, I never really thought about Lassie's experiences. That wasn't part of my world. Or young women thinking, oh, well, men have nothing to do with me. Can I just say it's something difficult. real quick? Uh, just, sorry, Red. Um, I thought when I read your book that at very different times in the book, the protagonist was pushed forward to continue a dream or a pathway or to change the trajectory. And this was very often motivated by female peers, right? Yes. Um, so to, to leave and do, to see something else or to explore kind of, you know, go to university and higher education. So I, I found it was quite interesting in, when, when reading a book. 
that was very much based on the real the real thing, you know, because I um, our schools amalgamated with a, an outside school, and I, uh, I had a real crush on one of these a straight A student, you know, and me and her started seeing each other actually, um, and she went to the University of St Andrews. Um, and it didn't last long, you know, but it was, it was aspirational in the sense that, you know, I wanted to do and be better because uh, that's what she would have expected, you know. Um, but I think, you know, and it, it maybe as a just, a just critique to say that, you know, women in the young team only serve the roles as what they do for men, you know, whether that's inspirational or whether that's instigational, you know. Um, but uh, of course, it's, it's a masculine book. It's about men. It's not really about women in that way. Of course, men... Um, you know, impacts masculinity is a huge impact on the female experience and lives. You know, what kind of partners they are, what kind of fathers they are. You know, um, most of, I mean, domestic violence, gender violence comes from men predominantly. You know, and that's a huge question about masculinity and um, and all that. So it is, it's the same question really. It's just people. You know, people in these communities. But you're right, the matriarchal figures, actually young men who work in class backgrounds and have got respect for women, they respect for mothers. Because to be honest, usually them that, that controls the finance and runs the home, whereas the fathers are, are not, you know, whereas in upper class families, it tends to be the father that's the main breadwinner and the mother less so, you know. And that's a, that's a paradigm shift I've seen, you know, it's been remarked on by young women I've met about the way young men, especially like myself, you know, they kind of get an expectation that they're going to be rough or unkind or unpleasant and they're quite pleasantly surprised often how respectful they are. But it's because of the respect they had for the matriarch figure, you know, our mother. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Emily, did you want to add uh, anything? Otherwise, I can... No, I, I do often see in our community a lot of women <clears throat> holding things together when the men are off being violent or what, you know, like the, the, the women are left. There's these older women in our community who've got so much on their shoulders. And I feel so much, if we could work with the families to really help su family support, you know, we run a family support group and it's it's amazing how much it does help. And like the young people cook for the families and they come in the evening and you just, there's so much pressure, you know, with money worries and violence and drugs and addiction. And these women are amazing and they're holding it all together. Um, so yeah, a lot of respect for, for those women, but yeah, in terms of like bringing discussion and we do have lived experience talks where we, we do talk about violence against women with the men and cause it is, there is, issue, there are issues there. So we, we do try to talk about these things and, uh, you know, try and, you know, make a change and model, model behavior, I guess, good and bring in people who have had lived experience and a lot of our team have as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a complex issue. <laughs> Start where you are, do what you can, use what you have. That's always my motto. <laughs> but there was, Matthias, Math, Mathis real, asked something about, and I wasn't sure what the question was in the... So yeah. my, my question is that you have basically, Glasgow is quite green, comparatively speaking, to a lot of other cities. Yeah. My question is kind of like this formalized access. We know the Children's World, we know Andrea and quite a few of the other people who are involved there. And, and only after this kind of like became a bit more formalized space was it kind of like actually becoming a useful space, I well, thought. That, that's what we deliberately did because we have, Glasgow has parks and green spaces, but people aren't using them enough. So deliberately, the way the Children's Wood started was we went to the schools and said, we'll run sessions for you. So I remember the first session, like the kids were like, had never played outside before, could not believe it, you know, but they said they loved it. So, and then we, we started a play group, we started events, we actively encouraged them, we, we employed Andrea, uh, we've now got community gardens. We've actively encouraged people onto land for school, for learning, for events and we, we took a sort of three approach attack. It was events, weekly playgroups and school sessions. And what we found was kids were pestering their parents, can I come to the event? And they'd bring the parents down. Uh, the parents would be standing there going, oh, I don't wanna be here, you know. Um, and then you've got families bringing their kids, you know, from, they live in high rise flats and they, they now see this as their back garden. So we act, that was our approach. And that's actually, it was at the same time, the campaign, this was our campaign, but we were creating a counter we were creating something more than just don't build here. We wanted to create something lasting. So yeah, so it started off just people were quite scared. I remember people say, oh, there's a pedophile in the bush and stuff like that. You know, they never say that now because it, it's a really safe space. 
um, so people were quite scared of the land. And I remember Andrea and I used to pick up like 40 dog poots like before events, you know, it was disgusting. Um, and so, yeah, so it's been, it, it was an active decision to, to build community there. Um, I don't know if that answers what you're what you're. You know, is it is it possible to extend that to other places? Is basically kind of like because there is so much green in Glasgow in a way. That's what we would love to see. I mean, that was partly why I, I wrote that. But I mean, I'm not a writer. I'm not like I don't write like Graham writes. But it was Carol had asked me. I, I feel really strongly about this. Glasgow has so many spaces, and we've got like derelict spaces that would be so easy to take over like so easy, you, you know, to, it wouldn't cost much. And if you had people facilitating them, so, which doesn't take much either, you know, you, um, then you get the, so it cuts the red tape. We've got 22 schools who can walk to our land for outdoor learning and they do walk. So we have forest school. There's a wee video, if you go to the Facebook or the Twitter page, there's a lovely video on the BBC of the kids from St. Charles rolling in mud, splashing in puddles, build mud, kit. we've got a mud kitchen and things. So. It's yeah, I would love to see more places like that because I feel children have a right to play outside and access nature and that actually can help with their mental health, their learning, because when you're outside, you actually focus better. That's a um, that has been shown. Um, so, yeah, come on. Anyone in here want to do it? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I have one more question in the chat that I just found from John Crawford. Um, what if school is the source of trauma, um, for example, um, for children with autism? Who brokers for the child? I think it's a very relevant question if you come from a school in a high deprivation area, you know, like um, Airdrie and Coat Bridge, uh, you know, Airdrie Academy and Coat Bridge High School, which is two schools I attended, were uh, war zones at times. Um, it could be quite frightening places to be, um, even for young men like me who are tough, you know. Um, you know, I got involved in quite a lot of bother in school with other pupils because you had all these competing gangs in the same territory, you know. So um, sometimes you were safer staying away from school, you know, which is obviously a, a sad reality because what we what were we doing when we weren't in school? We were, we were consuming alcohol and drugs, you know, in dangerous places and we were on the streets, you know. Um, so yeah, I think um, in, a, in schools, even in that area, I did endeavour to make them as safe as possible, you know, um, but I'm not sure. Need more youth clubs, I think, as well, would be good, more safe spaces. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't think there are any other questions in the chat right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for moderating um, this Pleasure. conversation. Thank you, Graham and um, Emily, for Pleasure. joining us and sharing your experiences and reading from your books and, um, and really enlighten us um, with this um, conversation and discussion. I'm going to um, stop the recording now.